Good afternoon, everyone. We are excited to be in this conference. Um, in fact, this is one of the best conferences we've ever been to. Um, not many times your work gets showcased in the keynote. So, and on top, and to add to it, uh, incredible audience. I mean, everybody we ran into yesterday and today had so much uh, stuff to tell us about Flipkart Lite, um, all the positive feedback we got. Thank you, thank you so much. We are really honored to be here. In fact, there was so much stuff on Twitter. We were actually spending all night to go through all that stuff. There's so much stuff going on, and especially the feedback, right? I mean, this is just the beginning. There's a long way for us to go, and a lot of feedback we were getting. It's incredible. But truth be told, it wasn't an easy journey for us till here. Um, as many of you know, beginning of this year, we shut down our mobile site. And uh, we kind of actually committed to one thing, um, and one thing only, and that was like we wanted to give the best experience on mobile to our users. The challenge is to actually make this happen in a country like India. Um, Tal from her talk yesterday was giving out some astonishing numbers uh, about emerging markets and India in particular. Like a typical device in India is at least six times inferior to a normal device you would find here in terms of memory, CPU, um, storage. On top of it, you have 87% of your internet users on 2G network. If you actually kind of put this together, it's almost impossible to give a compelling experience on a mobile device. And we have one more challenge on top of it. We are an e-commerce application. Users don't come to e-commerce application every day. So when they come to you, you better be getting their attention. You cannot afford to throw dinosaurs at them. This really got us started on a completely different journey, a journey that we have never taken before. Um, in fact, um, it was such a soul-searching journey for us. We ended up with an awesome product that we are very, very proud of. In fact, we are so proud of it, I would not miss an opportunity to show it every time. Like, in fact, I was showing it to a lot of you guys yesterday when, whenever I ran into uh, you guys, and I'm going to do it one more time. I'm going to show a video of how Flipkart Lite actually works. So, OK. There you go. So you fire it off from the home page, just like an A2 page. There's a splash screen. You slide up the categories, look at how fluid the animations are, everything that expands. Um, this is actually a live app. I mean, you're looking at a live e-commerce app. Look at how fast the products are loading um, in the search page. And this is actually coming from our 30 million product catalog. Uh, the product page almost loaded instantaneously. I mean, all of this actually happened in a matter of two to three seconds. This is incredible. In fact, what I'm going to show you next is, most is the most um, useful feature that we built in Flipkart Lite. We just switched to offline mode and see what happened to the app. It is visually different to the user. It's not, no longer showing the dinosaurs. Um, the user is still able to do whatever he did in the last session. In fact, if you look at all of these products, everything is grayed out except the product he was actually browsing last time. So this is the offline experience on Flipkart Lite. There you go, online and it's back up. So how do you get this? You go to uh, flipkart.com on the latest Chrome or Opera browsers on your Android device, add it to your home screen, and boom. You don't have to install it or anything. That's it. Um, I, I actually have a funny story to uh, share here. When we were actually working on this um, internally, not many people in Flipkart actually knew about it. So when I was actually showing this demo to um, our leaders and all of um, um, the other flipsters, um, I was actually showing them, hey, so yeah, we call ourselves flipsters. Um, I was actually telling them, hey, here's a light app that we, we are working on. What do you think? Oh, it's cool. It's, it's fast. It's light. Yeah. How do I get it? Um, I don't see it on the Play Store. Oh, you, know, you won't get it on Play Store. You just have to go to browser and type in the URL. And this is after we shut down our mobile site. So everybody's jaws dropped. Oh, this is incredible. So yeah, I mean, we've, we've had an exciting, exciting uh, journey in coming up to where we are today. But we sincerely believe if behind every product, there is an incredible team to make this happen. And this product was no different. It was five engineers, 42 days, and we got it. In fact, I'm going to ask a couple of those engineers to come up on stage today to talk about what really happened in those 42 days. 
I mean, I know I, I was getting requests for too many Red Bulls. <laughs> but a lot more happened than Red Bulls. So I'm going to actually ask Jay to come up first, uh, take us through what really happened, and see. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jay Santosh. Uh, I'm part of the Flipkart team. I work as a UI engineer there. Uh, so we are uh, incredibly excited to you know, take you through what our journey was, what our experiences were when we were building this Flipkart Lite app. Uh, so when we, before we shut down our old mo mobile website, uh, this is how the rough flow of the application was. So the browser fires a request to the web server, which you know, in turn calls other API services, gets the data. Uh, I mean, it sends back a very fat HTML, and then from the CDN, we load further assets. Uh, this approach actually worked for, uh, I mean, no JS browsers that we had. Uh, if you see, like, back in India, uh, we had, like, about 60% that was coming from no JS browsers. Uh, supporting all of that was difficult and all that. But we wanted to uh, ensure that we wanted to give a very good experience. But the page load times in this approach really suffered a lot. So we had to trash this approach out. Uh, so what we changed now, so we thought uh, probably once the application is loaded, we can actually do a nice client-side application uh, uh, whenever uh, like on the client side. So f for the first page load, you actually uh, contact the web server, get the HTML uh, bootstrap shell, which loads up your single page application. Uh, then we went ahead and uh, added something called service workers. Uh, so this acted as a proxy for further requests uh, to API or push API or CDN. So we cached whatever we could, and uh, yeah, boom, uh, this gave us a lot of advantage. Uh, so a little more on the client side, what we did, uh, we used React to build a single page application, uh, navigating through the various pages with React Router. Uh, we also built a lightweight Flux implementation for, all, uh, for fetching data for our application. Uh, so we built something called uh, Frontend JS. Uh, so the GitHub link for the library is available in Flipkart slash Frontend. <coughs> Yeah, but still, the first pain time still suffered because we had to, uh, to load up fully the single page application so that it's interactable for the user. Uh, it still took a lot of time. So what we wanted to do was uh, enter HTML page shells. How many of you, I mean, I think through the Dev Summit, you've heard a lot about uh, what page shells are, what you can do. So we just go into a little more detail about what we did for uh, you know, rendering our HTML page shells. Uh, so we divided our application into two states. One is the loading state, uh, which is for before you even fetch the data, you know what your state can be. So that is what we call as the loading state. Then the rest of the application moves on to the loaded state, which is after you fetch all the data that you need. So a typical loading state would look something like this. So uh, this actually, like, you can actually give the user visual cues into how uh, the application will look like once the data is fetched. So you can actually render whatever you need upfront and before, uh, I mean, much easily than uh, after, than only rendering after you fetch all the data. So if we move on. Uh, so uh, how did we uh, achieve these HTML page shells? Uh, one thing that we uh, wanted to do was minimize uh, the server processing time as much as possible. So that meant uh, we, we wanted to do, we wanted to generate these HTML page shells upfront during build time itself. So whatever JS, CSS images that you write for your application, we ran it through Webpack, we generated bundles, uh, so once these bundles are generated, we process them through another render cycle, which allowed you to you know, generate the final HTML uh, page shells that you wanted uh, in the loading state. Because you can predict what the loading state can be for each of your pages, and you can generate them at build time. Uh, to give a little more idea into what we call as pages in a single page application is, uh, 
I mean, you have a lot, a lot of like logical pages in your application, and each of these can be generated as a static page shell for you to load them really fast. Uh, so this is now uh, the new state of the application that changed. So during the first page load, uh, you actually, uh, I mean, when you load up your single page app, uh, to load it, you first make server request, get the HTML page shell back. And this is something with uh, like very less processing time on your web server. I mean, this is not like generated at runtime. So it's like we, could, we were able to optimize a lot on that front. So once you get the uh, page shell back on the document, it's ready for rendering, because you have all the HTML uh, that you need to put the loading state on the browser. And uh, you also have to fetch the data now to fully render the application. So we utilized service workers. Uh, uh, we also utilize service uh, worker to, uh, no, once it's installed, we, we were able to fetch the rest of the page shells that are there in that single page application. So because uh, what you loaded up front was only the first page of your single page application, right? Uh, we also used service workers extensively to fetch all our data uh, endpoints, I mean, data from our endpoints. Uh, so we like if you see uh, the code a little, uh, you have like the API endpoints that we call. Uh, we uh, we kind of went with cache first strategy. So you can see for most of them we have like what is the fast, uh, fast SW dot fastest in our configuration for toolbox to fetch the data. Uh, but yeah, for fetching all the static assets etc., we use like uh, cache first. Uh, just to reiterate what cacheable HTML page shells are like, your page components are rendered in the loading state upfront when you load the HTML immediately with all the critical CSS in line so that it will allow us, we thought it will allow us to get to the first paint time really fast. So once you load this loading state, now you have to fetch the data, or you can also utilize whatever data you had prefetched using service workers. Uh, and re-render your application. Uh, this is one thing that I want to bring to your notice, that uh, in this kind of uh, an uh, execution, you can actually uh, have partial re-renders. Uh, compared to native uh, world, you can, so whenever the, uh, you need to change something on the screen, you need to re-render every pixel of it. So, uh, I mean, everything on your page on the native app. But here, you can actually have uh, partial re-renders possible. Uh, since we were using React, it allowed us to do so. Uh, another thing is uh, we get too excited about page shells. We could go ahead and generate lots and lots of page shells. If your application is like really complex, uh, I mean, you could end up with a lot of page shells, which uh, when you're prefetching after your service worker is installed, it might you know consume a lot of bandwidth for the user. Uh, so what we thought of was maybe this is not the right approach. So what we did was, uh, you know, if we analyzed our product, we went back. Uh, we analyzed like what are the product flows. So there are, uh, if you look at our e-commerce product, there is a phase where uh, the user, you know, browses uh, from the home page, searches for a product, goes onto the product page, and then goes onto the checkout phase, and then completes the payment flow. Uh, there is another flow called the uh, order management flow where he can manage his order, like returns and cancellations of his products. We also have like an account management flow for the user. Uh, if you analyze these flows, they are not really like uh, very interconnected. They are like you can kind of say they are mutually exclusive. Uh, so there is not a lot of back and forth between these flows. So what we did was we broke our application down into these product flows, which are mutually exclusive. And uh, I mean, instead of going uh, with a one big uh, monolith single page app. Uh, what we did was, uh, I mean, we broke it down into smaller uh, single page apps. So that way, uh, what it allowed us to do is uh, we were able to build and deploy this separately. We separated out the servers, set of servers that these are de deployed on. And uh, this gave us much more you know, freedom into you know, pushing whatever uh, FX to only one set of servers and not all of them at the same time. Uh, since we bundle them separately, uh, we went. We also decided that since all of the single page uh, applications behave in the same way, there is a possibility to share whatever common libraries and utilities that you have. Like for example, our uh, front end JS implementation, the React library, we were able to you know 
make it all common for all the uh, applications. And what was needed uh, to make it work as a, and it, it almost made uh, the whole application work as a you know, kind of a big single page app. Uh, so what was, uh, SW Toolbox has this another wonderful thing, which, uh, which is like it supports ExpressJS uh, style routers, routes. So <coughs> yeah, so you can actually model your application and uh, you can put in logic in your uh, service worker code to uh, you know, manage your routes of your product flows in such a way that uh, you can actually, whenever you needed an app-to-app -app navigation uh, of all your single page apps, it meant you only need to download app specific files because uh, you had all, I mean, you can actually, uh, because we had already prefetched and uh, pre cached the common libraries that were needed for uh, you know, loading the single page application. So the results of what we did here uh, is like, we actually tested on a 3G connection first. And uh, after the page load, uh, these were just, uh, I mean, this was a timeline that we could achieve. So we could actually get to the first paint in like 30 milliseconds time. And that's, and that was something phenomenal. And uh, this way, like, uh, I mean, we then went ahead and tested it on 2G. And voila, the ch results didn't change. We were able to achieve the same paint, uh, first paint times as uh, that was uh, possible in a faster connection 3G or Wi-Fi. So this was really like uh, made us really happy, and this is where like the power of service workers uh, comes in for you, uh, where even in flaky networks you can actually load an application state for the users upfront with really faster times. Uh, so I'll go ahead and hand over to Abhinav. Uh, he's my fellow teammate. He'll uh, walk you across the rest of the journey that we had. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, so introduce me. My name is Abhinav Rastogi. Uh, I'm a UI engineer at Flipkart in the same team. So yeah, I think we established yesterday that you guys are pretty comfortable with British accents. Uh, let's see how it goes with Indian accents. Uh, we'll find out. <laughs> All right. So the first thing I want to talk about uh, is um, the Add to Home Screen feature and how we utilize it. Uh, so it is a very uh, important feature you know, when you are a progressive web app. Uh, and especially for an e-commerce channel uh, like Flipkart, uh, it becomes very important to re-engage the user uh, very easily with very less friction. Uh, so when we went native only, when we were only apps, uh, the app installs were a very important metric for us at all times. How many people are installing it? What's the current active user base? Uh, the same thing happened when we went as a progressive web app. Uh, the add to home screen uh, tends to be, uh, at least it seems, it is an important metric because people who come from the home screen uh, tend to be, uh, you know, uh, it's easier to convert those users. So uh, at uh, at to home screen, uh, as we discussed, uh, as it was being discussed yesterday, uh, has a certain uh, heuristic that the browser implements before it allows the website to show a pop-up uh, to uh, the, the br native browser pop-up to add to home screen. Um, which, for a very good reason, doesn't happen on the first time. Now, uh, when a user lands on our website, uh, add to home screen is something that is a very new feature, and especially for an audience like uh, like the Indian audience, uh, we may need to we realize we may need to train the users of what this feature is and what are the benefits. So for that, what we did was we created a first-time user experience, which trains the user what uh, what add to home screen brings to the table for him. So let me show you a quick demo of what kind of a experience we built. So this is our loading state, and this is the experience that we built. Uh, we give a brief explanation of what Flipkart brings uh, to the web, and this we give we tell the user that it's just a tap away, and this is what you get when you add to the home screen. And it's dismissible, and you use you continue using the uh, website like you would, and it's only for the first time, first visit, where anyway the uh, no, add to home screen native popper will not show up in any case. But uh, going further, uh, we again need to uh, prompt the user, uh, not prompt, but we need to give uh, some way to the user to add to home screen whenever he wishes to do so. For that, this is what we did. 
we add a small uh, we added a small add to home screen uh, button at the corner which again guides the user of how he can add to home screen manually so if you look at it carefully to drag to get his attention to the icon and th again this happens only once or twice in the first few visits we shake the icon a little bit and we also tap into the hardware access that we have and we trigger a navigator vibration which immediately brings the attention to something that is shaking on the screen So the next thing I want to talk about is the splash screen. Now again, this is a very cool new feature which makes it very difficult for a, a, a layman to distinguish between a web app and a native app. So what happens is when you add a, you add your manifest, you add your theme colors, uh, and you know you add your icons and text, uh, your splash screen shows up, well and good. Another thing. Uh, what we saw after this is that the splash screen shows up, which prevents the user from seeing a blank page. Uh, you immediately see a splash screen, and you go to the uh, application. What happens after this is some of our data is still loading, at least on our home page, right? So we added we added another layer. We added another um, splash screen, so you could say, or uh, uh, a loading state for our home page, uh, which triggers for both when you launch from the home screen or when you directly open from the browser. And as you will notice, I will just play this. This is the native uh, apps load this, and this is what we added over that. So we tried to reuse the same experience, and but add a loader over that. And when it fades out, the experience is ready to use. This gives a very seamless experience to the user. There's no jank. There's no jumping of content as it loads, or things like that. Another thing we talked about yesterday was the custom navigation UI. So Alex pointed out yesterday that you need to have uh, a cust you need to provide a you, you need to provide the user with some way of navigating, right? So when you go to full screen, you lose the browser traits that are there, and the browser brings some very useful features to the table. Uh, it brings you the it it brings the ability to go back for a user to refresh to go to the home uh, to go to your home page and things like that. So when we go full screen, we need to build this. And this is exactly what we added. So as you navigate across the app, uh, we have a dynamic header which adds uh, the back buttons and home and search and things like that. right? And it's dynamic. Uh, now we can customize it. So across different pages, it behaves differently. So if you load a model, the same header can show a close button and things like that. Now. As we have been talking about service workers quite a lot, right? So let me also add a little more to it. So uh, the next thing we built was a rich offline experience. Some some examples that we saw so far are uh, that if you uh, if you uh, go offline instead of showing a dinosaur, one thing we can do is show a custom error page, which at least tells the user that you know we know what happened, that you know something went wrong, we are not able to access the internet. We went a step ahead, and as we showed you in the demo earlier also, we built an experience that, that is delightful uh, to experience. So as you will see here, when you go offline, okay, now we are just going to airplane mode to uh, demo that. We changed the color scheme of the application, which guides the user uh, without any annoying pop-ups or modals or you know popovers and things like that or consistent banners that you are offline, like you know like in your face error messages. We avoid that, and instead we give a delightful experience, no matter what the situation is. The next thing I would like to talk about is what we did with some hardware APIs. Now that we have good access to really good hardware APIs. The first thing we decided to do was try out geolocation, which gives us a very easy win. Uh, we just pick up, we just, uh, the, we are just one tap away for the user's permission to access his location, and we are able to accurately and easily predict how much and how much time can we get a product to his doorstep. Just makes it very easy and delightful for the customer. Another thing we did was added an Easter egg. So, the, <laughs> the API that we used here, just to give you a hint, is the uh, accelerometer API. I won't tell you what the Easter egg is, but I will tell you how to trigger it. On the home page, you can simply tap the logo twice, and you should see something happening based on the extrometer data. You can try it out at flipkart.com. Now, with all, while we are doing all this, we needed to make sure that we always made sure that a performance was always the first benchmark, the, the, the most important feature of our application. Yes, we treated performance as a feature and not a side effect. 
So we have been talking since morning about rail, right? And it really does help. If you follow these principles, it really does work. So the one that I, wa I, won't, I won't go into the detail of all four, but one that I want to talk about is the animations. And yes, since I'm talking about animation, I had to animate that. <laughs> so the animation part of rail says that you have to render each frame in under 16 milliseconds, right? So, uh, as we, uh, some of you might know, uh, there is a project called Project Ganesh, uh, which um, also is name of an Indian god. But uh, this is so. This is something that allows rasterization to happen on the GPU. What this brings to the table is a lot of performance benefits plus a lot of uh, benefits in terms of power consumption, right? So uh, you enable it. Uh, we enabled it using uh, uh, some hacks like a meta tag, uh, which en which enables GPU rasterization for us. And it gave us huge amounts of performance benefits. But there are a lot of gotchas there, right? It's not uh, just easy sailing all the way. One thing that we figured, I will give you one example. One thing that we figured was that animating SVGs is costly, right? So we figured that SVGs are actually vectors, right? And rasterizing them on GPU gets quite costly sometimes. And it goes into a specific rendering mode which currently with the current uh, technology is, didn't give us equal performance in all the phones. So, we, so what we did right now is that we can either remove those or we can uh, you know, replace them with PNGs. And one, of course, the obvious thing is that use opacity and transforms uh, instead of height, width, and those kind of things uh, so that you avoid uh, unnecessary layouts and paints. Just prefer compositing. So uh, here you will see an example that this is a website, this is a web app, which is able to give a consistent 60 FPS performance on these kind of animations across devices because of these kind of optimizations. And here is some proof. <laughs> All right, um, one last thing, uh, one more thing that I want to touch upon is security that we talked, uh, that Emily talked about yesterday. HTTPS is really a baseline now. We achieved the shiny green lock, as she said, uh, and we have to tell you that uh, it brings perceived security, which is very important in a country like India, and it also brings a very real uh, security benefit. We implemented end-to-end -end HTTPS and made sure that there is no mixed content in any of our pages. This also gave us the benefit that it is future-friendly. What I mean by that is that I can think of at least two use cases. Like, for example, we heard yesterday that hardware APIs, because of privacy reasons, might become, some hardware APIs might become restricted to HTTPS access only. For example, your camera or your location. We are ready for that. And the second is HTTP2. It can give us great performance benefits, and that is on the cards for us very soon. And HTTPS allows us to um, proceed on that without hindrance. We also heard yesterday about content security policy, which allows us to set a specific response header uh, which tells the browser to very specifically uh, allow only certain, certain types of assets to be loaded from certain types of domains. So uh, the simplest form of a CSP is that you just give a default SRC, and that's it, it works. But for a complex website, it might be that you have uh, a variety of uh, different um, domain origins for your different kinds of content, so you can configure all of them separately. All right, um, so this covers a, a lot of the basic stuff, uh, the, a, a lot of the modern web technologies that we're using in Flipkart Lite. But uh, this is not the end of the story. This is just the very beginning. We are just getting started. We are deeply committed to the open web, and we would like to see this on all modern browsers, and definitely giving the same experience across all modern browsers. So currently, what you see is the minimal experience. It's just the quick buy flow that the user is able to open the website, search for a product, and buy it. Right? and the rest of the pages, like your accounts and your orders and things like that, which are, of course, necessary. We want to add a lot more things. We want to enable things like push notifications, which brings users back, uh, with, and we can tempt them with great offers as and when needed. With this, I will hand it back to Amma. I don't know what was harder, doing all of this in 42 days or talking about it in 30 minutes. Well, yes, like Abhinav said, we are excited about what's um, yet to happen in, in this space, and we are deeply committed to this. I would actually like to take a moment um, to call upon the awesome Flipkart Lite team. Guys, please.
for the so those are the five engineers. He's our engineering manager and product manager. So thank you, guys.